Welcome to the Core Concepts Lecture Series. Now this is a, a series of lectures where we have religious leaders and spiritual leaders come to us and tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. And uh, today we have a very interesting speaker. I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a moment. I want to remind you that this is sponsored by one community, the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, Church of Revelation, and I Am Press. And um, you're welcome to pick this up on YouTube at uh, youtube.com, then go to the Renford Broadcast Network. We also have eight radio shows, all on uh, uh, the RBR Network. That's at blogtalkradio.com forward slash Renford. So there's a lot of material out there that we're making available. Now about our speaker today, Joey Montesi was, um, I got my mantra from the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in Hong Kong in 1971. All right? And this man has probably had more to do, not Joey, but uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in bringing meditation to the general public, when you say in America, than anyone else. There's been uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, there's been a, a numerous Indian uh, gurus and teachers that came here, but he did this by uh, not emphasizing the religion, emphasizing the physical, mental benefits of meditation. And um, this is uh, something I don't think most people realize. This is, this is the man. This is the man who really brought it to America. And Joy was one of the first transcendental meditation teachers, that's what they called it, transcendental meditation teachers in Memphis, Tennessee. And what year were, did you start doing that? Uh, well, I started by training in 70. I became a teacher in 72. All right, so it's right at the same time, yeah, at yeah. the same time that I was getting there. I, yeah. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. Happy to thank have you, you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's always, it's always a pleasure talking about this, even though I don't talk about it that much anymore. I used to teach back in the 70s and 80s, and um, then I had to actually uh, had children, and I had to actually make real money <laughs> instead of uh, instead of this. But it was always my greatest love and my greatest pleasure is to be able to tell someone about this and 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 and, and put them on the path where they can learn and have this experience for themselves. Um, Normally, in a lecture that I used to do, I would, I would not talk about Maharishi so much uh, as I am today, but I kind of thought Jim wanted me to talk a little bit about Maharishi and my experience with him. And um, it's, it's so amazing that, uh, that this, this, his story, um, first of all, I just want to say that um, I brought these pictures of uh, this is a picture I took of Maharishi in um, probably 73 or maybe 74, I can't remember. So you took it yourself? This is a picture I took myself. Uh -huh. uh, and Maharishi always gave credit to his teacher. He always, who he called Guru Dev, his name was Brahmananda Saraswati. And this is, this is Guru Dev here. This is the this isn't the same picture that's here, but this is an actual photograph. That's a painting. This is an actual photograph taken of Guru Dev. So the story there is so amazing to me that um, I was kind of thinking, knowing that I was going, going to be doing this today, it was kind of refreshing my memory about Guru Dev and Maharishi and the, the knowledge that they brought forward to the world. The knowledge that they brought forward to the world is nothing new. It's nothing uh, that hasn't been around forever. It's sort of like I used to, uh, in the 80s, everybody got a VCR and they plugged it in and it flashed 12 o'clock. Do you remember that? It just flashed 12 o'clock forever because nobody ever read the instruction manual and nobody ever set their clock. But, but, but in the creation, whatever your belief is, the creator put the instruction manual there. And, um, but, the, but we just sort of hit the ground running and we never take the time <clears throat> to learn about that instruction manual. It's not really a written manual, but it's 
the Vedas. It's the knowledge of life. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the Vedas later. Uh, but when Gurudev um, was nine years old, he set out on a spiritual quest to find enlightenment. I mean, how many nine years old do you know this? They get left their family with their family's permission to go and, and, and try to find uh, an enlightened master to teach him, to put him on the path of enlightenment. Um, he, very sh long story short, he finally found a master. He spent um, some time, three years with that master, learning um, uh, their routine. At 14, he spent the next 10 or 11 years in silence. Um, he came out of that silence and um, spent time again with his teacher. So many years with his teacher. During that time of silence, he only came out one day a year to speak, and that was with his master. Uh, at the end, uh, when he came out at 24, 25 years old, uh, he spent some years again learning, studying the Vedas, and then went into silence again for an enormous amount of time. I mean, in our lifetime, we can't even think of these numbers, but for 40 years, went into silence. Um, the seat of the Brahmacharya of India is a seat that, it's sort of like in the Catholic Church, there's the Pope. In India, there's the, um, in, I shouldn't even say India, in the, the Vedanta tradition, there's um, four seats of, of, of learning that were established by Lord Shankara. The Shankaracharya of the North, South, East, and West. The Shankaracharya of the North being the most, um, the highest seat of learning in their tradition. And it was vacant for about 150, some say 200 years. It's not like the Pope, where as soon as one Pope dies, they elect another. It's only a man who has the knowledge and has the basis to become Shankaracharya. Um, at the age of 70, he was asked to become Shankaracharya. And, um, and, and, um, and it was his decision to accept that position. And um, Maharishi um, was a young college student and had gone with some other college students to visit um, Gurudev and knew from the instant that he saw him that that was his teacher, that this man was enlightened, that that was going to be his teacher that he wanted to be around him forever. And he would do anything. And actually just became pretty much, I guess, what we would call his houseboy. He would clean up his room, sweep his room, make the bed, put his slippers where they needed to be, and just made sure his clothes were clean. He just did everything for him. Um, and then when he passed away, when Guru Dev passed away in the early 50s, uh, Maharishi himself finally spent some time in silence in uh, the same place that Gurudev did in Udakashi in the Himalayas. And after some time he started thinking that maybe the world, maybe he should go out and give this knowledge to people because it's a shame that it's only within a few uh, well, what I used to call crusty old, old, old guys. Because when, when I was 20 and I saw Guru Dev, he just looked like a crusty old guy to me. But he just, you know, but these guys were very austere. They were celibate, lifelong celibates. They were just, they ate only the purest, you know, food, obviously no meat. And, um, and they lived uh, very austere lives by our standards and a um, totally different kind of world. But Maharishi thought that there's no reason that everybody shouldn't have access to this, to have an experience, if they want it to happen. 
and to have it in a way that um, that took out, as, as Jim was saying in the introduction, that pretty much took out all the, it's not a religion, but some people may want to call it like uh, religious or, uh, or, or the, uh, theological or whatever background with it. They, just, just to learn the technique of how to allow the mind to experience its own nature in the simplest and purest way. This was a knowledge that was lost to the world for a couple of hundred years. All the meditation that Guru Dev found on his quest throughout India when he was a young boy required devotion, concentration, contemplation, some sort of control of the mind. And the mind is not something that wants any of those properties. The mind doesn't want, if it's devotion, it should be a natural thing. If you're devoted to your mother or to your child, it's a natural thing. It's nothing you can conjure. Uh, if it's the mind doesn't want to be fixed and concentrate or contemplate uh, as much as I, I and, and and I love aphorisms. I use aphorisms sometimes. That's not a part of TM, by the way, but I use them sometimes. I think they're great. But you, but the mind doesn't want to do that forever. The, it's a limited type of thing. The mind likes to be charmed. The mind loves to be charmed. And that's what meditate, what TM does. It's just like if you're on the beach and you're listening to the, somebody has a radio on over here, and, you know, you, you, maybe you listen to that because it's playing something you like. But then somebody else's radio or their walk, iPod, oh, wait, I'll call them walk and see. <laughs> iPod, it shows you how old I am. Their, their iPod is playing something even nicer. Then you want to, uh, then, then the mind just naturally is charmed in that direction, away from where it was before. Just like a bee is, we look at a bee and a child might say, well, it just goes from flower to flower. But what it's doing, it's going in search of nectar. And when it finds nectar, it stays there and it, and it extracts the nectar. And that's what the mind does. It wants, it, it's, it loves, it wants to be charmed and, and satisfied. In, a, in, in its way to greater and greater happiness. And that's what TM, the, the beauty of TM, that uh, what it is and what Maharishi did do is, is brought it out in its purest form and, and not adulterate it with a lot of do's and don'ts and uh, things that uh, compl would complicate it. It's, it. He brought it out in its it's, and it's, he called it a, a simple, natural, effortless process. And that's, so the, the effortless part is the thing that gets most people when they learn it. They say, is that, is that it? It's so easy. And we said effortless. <laughs> so effortless means easy. So it's simple, it's natural, it's effortless. It's natural because it uses the mind's own nature to go from where it is to a better place. And simple, self-explanatory. Self so, you know, we talked in four areas uh, when, we, when we used to, to talk about TM, when I used to lecture, there was four areas that Maharishi wanted to talk about. One was mental potential. And basically, over the years, when, you, when, you're, when you're really young, you think of mental potential as being something that is, uh, uh, you know, you want to develop great mental potential. But what, I, what really it turns out to be in my lifetime is that mental potential is that they say we use only 10% of our full mental potential. We only use full 10% of our brain. We're not really going to need, we don't need to expand the brain. The brain is big enough. If we could use 20%, we've doubled the size that we use. We don't need to expand the brain. What we need to do is wake up what we don't use. We need to, 
to allow the, the dying do the do anyway, but this one being the simplest, to to go to experience its own inner nature, to experience the mind at finer and finer levels, and begin to awaken those levels and use those levels. That's that's the greatest um, thing about this meditation is, is as far as mental potential. It's this it's beautiful. And um, so as we start using more and more, the mind is able to understand more and when and and know more and that when we understand more, we make fewer mistakes. Um, and when we make fewer mistakes, uh, we, we, you know, our life becomes a little bit better. If we just eat the right food, we just have to naturally choose this food over this one, maybe an apple over a bag of chips or something like that. Um, it's just we make those better decisions, fewer mistakes in our life. Maybe we don't even know why. We just start favoring those things. Um, and so our health becomes better. That was another area we talked about, health. As we're more relaxed, then there's, it's just like a car that's running and it's tuned and everything is just perfect. Just like a new car that's tuned perfectly, it runs great. It's a pleasure to drive. When a car is not tuned great and it's rough and it's out of sync and maybe missing a plug and one tire is uh, not so great, it's, it gets you where you need to go eventually. But it's not that pleasurable being in that car. You know? And so you want, your health is very important. And especially as you get older, um, you, you just, I mean, whether you're young or old, but you just want to be, you know, you, when, when things are, are more harmonious within yourself, then your health becomes uh, more, um, it just becomes better naturally. It's not, you know, I mean, I still get sick, but not as often, and I, you know, every, you know, Sure, of someone that is more, uh, you know, better than I am about doing my breathing and yoga and things that are good for me would get sick less than me. So, but but the meditation creates that harmonious state within it, the, our own self and our own being that we become healthier just naturally. Um, and then. The other two areas uh, that we talked about back then were social behavior and world peace. And um, basically, when you are feeling good, both mentally and physically, your mind is feeling good emotionally, you're feeling good, and health-wise, you're healthy, then you are able to get along with people around you better. You don't take things the wrong way. You know, people that are stressed out seem to always take things the wrong way. You can say, oh, you look good today. Well, what was wrong with yesterday? You know, I mean, you just, somebody can find a way to take anything bad. So, you know, you just see things for what they are. You see people for their, who they are, their potential. And you just, you know, um, so social behavior naturally becomes better. Your, your own social behavior and how you interact with people becomes better. Even bad situations, you can figure out things that work. Um, and then, as far as world peace goes, if more people felt like that, then world peace would come about more easily because it's hard to pick up a weapon or, uh, you know, or feel hate if you really... If you're feeling good, it's hard to hate. It's hard to hate when you're really feeling good. <laughs> That's the hardest thing to do, you know, is to really hate somebody when you're feeling good. You want other people to feel good, and that's why I started to teach. I wanted other people. I, I learned this, and I thought, oh, the whole world should know this. Everybody should do this, and so that's why I began teaching. And um, 
I enjoyed teaching, and um, maybe one day I will get back to it. Um, but, but right now, um, it's just not the right time. But I, I, it's always a good time to talk, to let people know what this is, and let them know that they can learn this technique. It's not something that uh, um, is, is secret. Maharishi wanted everybody in the world to have access to it and, and learn to meditate and teach their children so they grow up um, with less stress and more potential. Um, and so um, he created a, a great worldwide organization. He eventually, he passed away about three years ago and um, he, you know, basically said his goodbyes, and when a, an enlightened man, maybe you all have done some reading, when an enlightened uh, man uh, goes, it's called Maha Samadhi. He knows it's time. He, you know, takes care of loose ends. Then he closes his eyes and meditates, and the, and the soul leaves the body. It's a very quiet, it's a very, I've never seen it before until then, and, and I just saw what I could see um, on, from the photographs, but it was very beautiful. He, said, it was, he, was, he just meditated and then was gone. And so, but he left us, uh, you know, something that will go on, uh, go on and on. I mean, in the last, since he's gone, it seems like the movement has even gotten bigger. I don't know if his energy must be poured into this movement because he's, there, there are people now that, are, that will uh, seem to more openly talk about it and do more. Um, David Lynch is a, uh, a Hollywood director that has started the David Lynch Foundation to raise money to teach children to meditate. Uh, mostly children that come from deprived areas that would never get a chance otherwise. And um, so most of the children have been uh, uh, those type, you know, the deprived type of children. And the people that have raised money uh, for these have been people that have been with Maharishi uh, forever. Uh, Paul McCartney and, and uh, Ringo Starr, the two only surviving Beatles, when, when uh, uh, David Lynch did a did a fundraising concert. They were there uh, to raise money to, give, to, to do a concert and be part of that, along with uh, Donovan, who also is a lifelong meditator. Um, um, the Beach Boys. Um, let's see who else. Um, Jerry Seinfeld is a 40 year meditator. Most people don't know, maybe have heard that he meditates. Might surprise you that he's been meditating forever. <laughs> Forty years is a long time. He created or he brought to life many teachers. So he was a teacher of many teachers. I mean, Sheree, oh, yeah. Sheree Ravishenko, which is uh, now uh, that he sent on his way. Even uh, uh, even such teachers that don't have, that you don't hear about, like like uh, what. Uh, The, the one that's written so many books. Oh, 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 Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra oh, yeah. was trained yeah. by Maharishi. Yeah. And uh, and uh, Shri, Shri Ravishenka was told to go ahead and do. Yeah. He, he told he let yeah. him go. Well, I don't he, know how many others. But. Oh, well, thousands. Hmm? Thou literally thousands. I mean, because many, many were just like myself. and just became teachers. We taught as many as we could, some hundreds, some maybe thousands. And, and then went on to other things. Some are still teaching. Um, and um, yeah, he, he, um, he, he's, a, he's a teacher of teachers. He's the Maha Rishi. A Rishi is someone who is a, is a seer, but a Maha Rishi is a great seer of mantras. The, the person who knows what is the, the sound that you should use. And, um, because I don't know if any of you read about TM or any type of meditation similar to TM. There, you know, you, you have a one of the things you have is a, uh, that you're given is a mantra, 
and then a technique of using that mantra. It's, uh, uh, the mantra is chosen. There are thousands of mantras, but which one would you use? You know, and there are many, many techniques out there. Right? Which one would you use? And uh, it's sort of like um, uh, you take a, a, a great golfer, uh, a Tiger Woods, let's say, still a great golfer. You know, he's not number one anymore. Still a great golfer. And you might say, well, what kind of golf clubs does he use? Because I want to be like Tiger Woods. So, you know, just having the right equipment is not going to make you Tiger Woods. And have, you have to have the right technique. And so that's what you're taught in meditation is not only are you given the right equipment, but you're given the right technique. So it's a great, a great thing that he's done. And yes, he has taught lots of people. And then he, he's even broken down everything into different, later in his life, he went to, um, you know, uh, actually teaching things out of the Vedas that would make our lives better in the long run. Uh, for instance, our buildings that we work or live in is a thing, he, he taught about that, and that's something he called Stavaja, not he called, but something called Stavaja Veda. It's been around for thousands of years, but he, he brought that knowledge to the, the world so that they would know how to build buildings that would be more life supporting if you lived in those buildings. Um, Ayurveda, which deals with, um, with health, in, in specific health issues, uh, how, what to eat, what not to eat, what is your body type, and so what you should avoid and what you should have may be different than what somebody else should have. Um, there's Gandharva Veda, which, as a musician, I, well, Gandharva Veda has to do with music, and as a musician myself, I always thought that that was one of the things that people really don't understand is how much of an influence correct music has on you, and how much an influence, let's put it, really bad music has on the mind. You look at a lot of people that you see on the news every night in Memphis, and you imagine what music they're listening to. And it kind of goes hand in hand. If you listen to great music that's well thought out, and, um, especially the classic Ayurvedic music, I mean, I mean, uh, Gandharva Vedic music, it would be uh, quite different. And if you, I had a friend who brought his children uh, listening to that music as they were old. children. He played it every night before they went to sleep and they they're very strong kids. Um, anyway, so there's 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 uh, Vedas that deal with every part of life. And uh, but the beauty of of TM is you don't have to know any of that. I mean the first twenty years I meditated I didn't know what uh, Ayurveda was or Gandharva Veda or, or Stapacha Veda. I just meditated. And um, so you. Are there a lot of TM teachers now? Not so many. Most of them have, you know, had, uh, I mean, a few passed away. It's been a long time or some of them uh, quit because they had to move on. But, uh, and then there are new people. There are new people, that, but I don't know who, who they are. And, you know, I used to kind of know a little bit about. But I've been out of it myself for so long. You kind know, of the point man here, though, if they want to know something or do something in Memphis. Well, the easiest thing to do is to go to tm.org. And there's some great videos there. Not dull videos, but really interesting things there. And they can lead you if you wanted to learn. You put in your zip code. They'll match you up with the closest teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are no teachers in Memphis anymore. But... Um, I don't know how many books that Maharishi wrote, but he wrote one that was just a fantastic book. If you want to read about the law of being, the universal law of being, you want to get a hold to a copy of The Science of Being and the Art of Living by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Yeah. It's one of the two best books on, the, on that law, on that principle, yeah. being. Yeah. And, uh, and I would highly recommend that one. The other one is his, his um, translation and commentary on the Bhagavad Gita which is, is really good because he takes each word, each phrase, 
and goes into uh, into that in such a way that um, um, in the light of his understanding of, of things, if you read his translation and commentary, it might be different than someone else's translation and commentary, but it's, in, it's from his enlightened point of view that he's looking at things. So I know I've talked a lot longer than I really had planned. I, I, I really wanted to open it up for questions earlier than this and see if you had anything that you wanted to ask and you change directions or go where you want to. Yeah. Are you familiar with the person? I'm sure you are. Kriya Yoga is what Yogananda introduced. Paramahansa Yogananda. Paramahansa Yogananda. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote the Autobiography of Yoga. I went to the, you heard Roy Eugene Davis. Uh, he's one of his chief American disciples, Roy Eugene Davis. Oh, okay. He, he did a, he does a, he used to do a retreat every year called uh, Kriya Yoga Initiation. Mm -hmm. And I did that and I did experience this, some meditative states just after being there for a week, just hanging out in his right. space. Right. Uh, and he gave me a, a mantra that I could use. And I did experience this, you know, starting to happen to me. And it scared me. I thought, oh my God, what's happened to me? And I backed away from it. And you know, it's, you know I, what's, what's scary is you're, you think you're losing yourself sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But what you're just losing is the stress. Yeah. So I want to get stress. back into meditating. It's, but that's been like, uh, that was back in 79 or something. That's how long I've been away from meditating. And I really want to get back into doing it. Would you recommend that I get with a TM person or just go back to what I was taught there at that? Can you, place? can you, do you still give people mantras? No, I, I don't teach anymore, but um, I would say if, if you're happy with that and that's where you started, you know, because I would only say that about Yogananda. Yeah. I wouldn't say that about, I won't mention any other name. Yeah. Okay. I don't think there's anybody else I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, but only because that's where you started. If you don't have anything mm -hmm. yet that is from a, a great tradition like his, so we don't get on to next to Maharishi, you would you would recommend? Well, I think there. he's probably the greatest uh, teacher next to Maharishi that, that came to the United, that came to America. There's been so many; those are yeah. the best. I mean, those, those are really the, the most, the highest integrity mm -hmm. of people. And, um, but yes, if, if you if you had never heard of Yogananda, and you never, I would say, oh, of course, you know, mm -hmm. learn TM, because mm -hmm. TM is, it's the, um, you know what it is? Every, all roads lead to Rome. Mm -hmm. You can go, you can do any technique, will get you there. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you wanted to start out today and get to New York, you can get in your car, or you can take a train, you can, you know, take a bus, you can walk, you take a bicycle. But the easiest thing is to get on an airplane and in a couple of hours, two or three hours, you're there. It's the least stress path. It's the simplest path of least resistance. And that's what uh, develops. I mean, that's what TM is. It's the simplest, easiest thing. If it was, there's nothing easier, nothing simpler. I mean, I've looked at all over the years, and but anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to ask you now. You started back in like '72. Yeah. I, well, I went to my first lecture in '69. I started in '70, yeah. but I did became a teacher in '70. And you got into what you were doing it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to stay with that discipline? There's. Well, I'm going to be very honest with you. There've been times where where I um, get into the world too much. And the world draws you out. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, but, but I've always been felt better about yeah. who I am. And there's a term that people started using a few years ago, comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, it's always, I always feel better when I meditate twice a day. Just 20, 15 or 20 minutes now, twice a day. I'll, I'll tell on him a little bit. If he gets really stressed and had a problem, he would go to Iowa oh, yeah, yeah. and spend time with the cities. Yeah. And uh, you might tell them a little bit about that. Well, Maharishi always thought, especially for us that were teaching so much and dealing with, you know, bringing people 
from wherever they are to the finest experience of life. And he thought it would be best if every, you know, at least once a year, maybe twice a year, that we would come in and spend some time just quietly meditating ourselves, maybe taking two or three days of silence and just doing nothing but meditating. Mm -hmm. But even in that, you know, maybe there for three or four weeks and, and meditating, going to classes and, and mm -hmm. kind of getting refresher courses. Um, I always felt that that was, it's, it's, it's like a retreat, you know, in a way. I think everybody needs a retreat sometimes. Uh, life is, draws us too much into activity. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I have missed, but I regret the times that I've missed. I always think it's so much nicer. I feel so much better, more integrated, so much more comfortable in my own skin. Why do I, why do I, why did I skip that? Especially when I close my eyes, I haven't meditated for two or three days or something. So I close my eyes and after a minute, I think my first thought is, why do I, why do I skip this? Why do I not do this? You know, so it's, it's so easy. Now the, the, it's the school, the, the, the name has changed, I believe. It changed from, yeah, uh, it used to be called Maharishi International University, and now it's Maharishi University of Management. And it's in Fairfield, Island. And it's, uh, does it have regular courses? Oh, yeah, they have a call, they have, it's a full college. I mean, they, actually, they have a kindergarten, a grade school, a high school. All that came later. The first thing that came about was the, the college. And um, they have some, um, you know, very successful actors and and producers, um, advertising people, business people, um, people from every walk of life that have graduated there and gone on to, to great things. Because, and, and especially the high school gets great. I mean, they're it's a little school, and they win all these awards for acting and uh, basketball and all this stuff because the kids are just they're not. They're just not stressed out. They have more energy and less stress, so what do you expect's going to happen? The more, uh, maybe glamorous, the more the, the, the part that is uh, maybe more intriguing for a lot of people are the cities. Could you tell them a little bit about that? Okay, well, um, back in the mid-70s, Maharishi started talking about um, um, it was uh, the, the cities, which came from a book called, I mean, I guess a book that we kind of know of as, it's called Love and God. It's a book, that, that was what Christopher Isherwood, he did a translation of the, the, of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Was Maharishi Patanjali wrote the Yoga Sutras probably two or three thousand years ago. I'm not sure the exact time that those were written. But if, if, if you look, those are yoga aphorisms. We have our aphorisms that people write now, but yoga aphorisms are things that uh, actually take us to the highest, uh, they actually bring us, they make us think in directions we might not have even thought the human body or the human mind was capable of. There are many yoga aphorisms in the book of, of, uh, of Maharishi Patanjali, but um, if you, uh, but some of them he had were like um, uh, maybe just things that like you know better health, um, being able to see things at a distance, like more like clairvoyance or clear audience. But one of the things that kind of organizes the body the most is yogic flying, being able to fly uh, to levitate or fly through the air, and uh, so that's one of the uh, things that we practiced uh, or. Still, still do, um, and um, the um, I guess there's maybe 20 yoga af aphorisms that, that I practice. Uh, they are um, when when flying comes about, there are some people that actually lift off for a few seconds. It's mostly at this point, you know, just their own body's energy pushing them off the ground rather than. Than lifting off, as far as I know, but um, 
but it's, it's a thing that can't be replicated. Uh, they tried to get um, athletes and football players to do the same thing and prove that all it was was just um, their body just pushing themselves off the ground and they couldn't do it for a half an hour or more like some of these people were, some of the, uh, the uh, Marishi uh, Sidhas were doing. And uh, it's because it's a different thing that's going on. You're just having this, you're just using this aphorism in a certain way and then when it takes place, it just, it's just a natural uh, thing that takes place. It's not a thing that you're trying to do because, if you, uh, because some people go through this and some don't. I don't particularly go through it very much. I feel the energy and maybe sometimes will you know, kick around a little bit, but some people really get off the ground. Did you know a guy named uh, John Feely? He used to be a classical guitar. Yeah, I, it was a great friend of mine, John. He used to do it. He said he could yeah. do that, but he said he wouldn't just really just hover and yeah. bounce. Or, you know. Yeah, John was a yeah, Irish guy, a great guitarist. He was, yeah. I don't know what happened to him. He moved back to Ireland. Yeah. But that was, golly, that was yeah. way in back. the 80s. Yeah. yeah. What a great thought. <laughs> He's a great person. Are there some other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shaking your head. Yes, you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I remember, well, I didn't actually see it, but I remember people going to Earth, Wind, and Fire concerts and said they actually levitated too. And this is back in the 70s. Really? That they on stage. Oh, was witness. I'm from mm -hmm. Los Angeles, so yeah. you know a lot yeah. of stuff would happen. I don't know. I don't know about Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, maybe you know. I mean, it could have been magic. A lot of people in the '70s, because of Doug Henning, who was also a meditator, became the most famous musician in the world before he passed away later on. But he uh, he uh, made magic real popular. A lot of music acts were using magic. Maybe they were, you know, I, I'm not going to say either way what they represented there, but, you know, even went to a Con Cat Stevens concert and they brought out like a red block box of blue one and green one and a yellow one and stacked them up and then the doors opened and he walked out with his guitar and started playing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway. Well, Maharishi had the university here, but he eventually moved everything, uh, or his own entourage, lock, stock, and barrel to Holland. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, yeah, you know, it's really funny. Um, I'm watching this this news program on Scientology a couple of days ago, and they've been fighting for years to try to become a religion so that they could get the IRS deduction. Scientology? Scientology, yeah. Maharishi always tell, said that we were, you know, and, and it's not a religion. I mean, I've never worshipped anything, you know. It just, it's a technique. And and um, and yet the IRS wanted to call us, the TM movement, a religion. So here's one group trying to find, you know, to become a religion, and, and they won't allow it. And here's our group that says, no, we're not a religion. And the court says, yes, you are. Like, you know, that's what's so funny. But um, anyway, what was, your, what was the question? Well, I just said that he, I knew that he moved and, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. set a school he, or something up in Holland. Yeah, he uh, set up his world headquarters in Holland because he said it was just, I don't know. It was Americans are too crazy. Right? It was just too crazy. <laughs> it's just too crazy. You know, people want to accuse you for being something you are and, or something that you're not, you know. But it never was. I mean, if I was ever asked to kneel down and pray or worship something, I'd probably be the first to leave. I don't know. I might give it a chance, but I've never even been, I've never been asked to do anything like that. It's just a technique. It's, it's like this. Let's say nobody in the world ever brushed their teeth, but there was a religion over here and they brushed their teeth. And you said, okay, well, look, I don't want to be that religion, but you know, that brushing your teeth bit, that's a really good thing to do. <laughs> you know, so we borrow that. And if we all started brushing our teeth, it wouldn't make us that religion. We're just taking a technique that they do and we use their technique to make our life better. And that's what TM is. We're just taking 
a technique from this ancient tradition that never was a religion. Even the tradition is not a religion. Uh, and uh, and um, now, where, where do you differentiate between Hinduism and which is considered a religion and the uh, Maharishi's teaching, which you consider not a religion? Well, um, the, the, the path of Vedanta is the path of, of knowledge, and it is for enlightenment. Um, Hinduism is, is maybe an offshoot of that, and it has a lot of gods and worshiping and you know, things that I don't understand. I did go to India one time to be with Maharishi there, and um, uh, I didn't understand a lot of the local customs and beliefs of, you know, offering rice and butter ghee and, and things like that to statues and of, their, of the gods. But, I mean, I guess if they looked at, uh, I was brought up Catholic, and I'm not sure that I'm the best Catholic in the world, but I guess if somebody looked at somebody kneeling down and praying to a statue of, of Mary or Jesus, they might have a similar, you know, thing. Thing, you know. The, so the Hinduism, they have their own beliefs, and it is, I guess, a, a, a religion. Whereas Vedanta, I mean, even the Hindus say it's more of a way of life and not a religion. But if Hinduism is a way of life and not a religion, then Vedanta is even more so a way of life and less so a religion. It's more of a scientific thing. Maharishi, actually, for so much of the 80s just talked in scientific terms. He, he wanted everything to be explained. He didn't want any mysticism, no magic. He wanted everything to be explained. So he, 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 he's, he had great scientists come and speak to us about everything. Uh, from, uh, I, there, I was looking up this man that spoke with us. Do you know that the, the term stress was not in the English language 100 years? A man named Hans Selye uh, coined the term stress because he said, because he, well, he visited us. He, I mean, so we had all these great people that would, Buckminster Fuller, I mean, people that you even dream of ever being in the same room with. And, uh, but Hans Selye said, you know, what, he said, you go into a hospital, you see a bunch of sick people, what did you, what's the first thing you notice? They all looked sick, you know. <laughs> So they, so that was, so he, he, he studied that. I think he coined the term in, uh, in the 30s, but, you know, so the term stress is not even 100 years old. We use it so much now, but uh, it's, um, Didn't have airplanes that got stress on the wings 100 years ago. <laughs> I guess they, the, the engineers use a different word back then. I, I spent uh, five weeks in India and in, uh, Rajasthan, the northern part. Udapur, Jaipur, oh, yeah. uh, Amaritsa went to the Golden Temple of the Sikhs and all that stuff. I saw more temples than I ever wanted. I never wanted, I don't really need to ever see another uh, temple. Even um, in some cases, mosques and Catholic churches oh, yeah. that we visited in oh, the country. It's a very, it's a, yeah. it's a place where religion plays a, yeah. a tremendous part. And, uh, and then you have um, teachers coming out of there that are, not even a religion. That's that's an interesting uh, wow. dichotomy, don't you think? Well, that's true. That's true. I don't know. I mean, religions religion is is, is is great. It serves a purpose, except to the point where it divides. And that's the only point where you know it seems to slow. Or sells fear. Or sells fear. Yeah. I, I had just one last question. Yeah. Um, is it does it happen uh, with a a lot of the people who practice transcendental meditation for a long enough period of time, for years, so that they have a, like a powerful awakening experience. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I don't know if it takes years. I mean, yeah. it it depends on the individual. Yeah. Depends on where their nervous system is already. Um, um, I mean, I've heard stories that I. I've heard, you know, secondhand. I don't know that they're all true. But let's just put it this way: some people could sit down for their very first meditation, mm -hmm. and and um, something happens. Uh, other people takes 
quite a long time. It depends on the individual nervous system. But um, I think that if you're, you know, if you if you if you meditate, it's it's even the first meditation. I think is good. I can remember my first one. I just was. I, I just remember. I just had been instructed, and I didn't even know if I was meditating. And I heard the, the birds just seemed so much more vivid, mm -hmm. and um, they were outside the window. And I just, you know, I think that that from the very first time you have a, a good experience, the very awakening type of meditation could happen anytime, you know, and. You know, I think it's 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 best. You know, if you can go on a retreat, what did I do? If you can go on a retreat, or um, you know, where you can get some longer meditation, or not more meditation. You don't want to meditate a long time, but let's say if you have the time, you meditate a third time that day, or maybe a fourth time. But you don't want to meditate for three hours. Or can can be reading or listening to people talking about it that that inspires you to to do it. Yeah. Yeah. To, to continue it, to make it a, a, a regular part of your life. Right. But I'm just talking about the experience itself. The reading is an inspiration, and knowledge is a great thing to have because uh, because it's, it, 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 okay, you, you studied with the Yogananda people. Maharishi always talked about this. It's like having the, the biggest diamond in the world. Mm. A friend gives it to you. This is a gift. Mm. And you wear it, and it's so great, and everything. But then sometime, instead of being at your home where everything's comfortable and everything, you're, you're, you're walking down the road and it's hot and that time is pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. And all you're thinking about is, you know, if I get rid of this thing, mm -hmm. I can lighten my load. Mm -hmm. And you get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You get rid of the, the most valuable thing that you have. But you get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Because of the events of life. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, so it's good to have knowledge, because if you have the knowledge of how valuable that is, then you won't give it up. If, if, if it happens if you're interrupted, you won't give it up completely, forever. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the thing about having knowledge about what you're doing. Can I, can I, uh, I know we're right here at the end, yeah. on a little humorous note to share a, a, a yoga joke real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the yogi goes to a dentist to have a tooth extracted. And the dentist is getting ready to give him Novocaine. can. He said, no, I don't want anything like that. And the dentist says, what? You don't want to have something anesthesia? And he said, I want to prove that I can transcend dental medication. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't heard oh, it, I think I heard that, but yeah. I, I forgot it completely. I just, I couldn't until you said it. I want to thank you for coming and, and sharing. Thank I think that was really, really good. And really enjoyed it. Even things that I, you hadn't, we hadn't talked about before you were revealing there. You know, that was really good. We, our speaker next Sunday is Ronald McDonald. This is not the guy who founded McDonald's. All right? He claims that he had his name Ronald McDonald before McDonald's ever existed. And uh, he is a spiritual counselor and he is a Quaker. And he'll be coming next week to tell us uh, something about what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. That's our, that's our program. Thank you very much for being with us today, and thank you again. Yeah.